Uh, my name is Jonathan Tuck. I'm a technical account manager here at UpGuard, and I'm going to be moderating this afternoon's panel discussion. Uh, for today's discussion, we have three UpGuard customers as guest speakers from the health insurance industry, and we'll be discussing topics around vendor risk management processes and also discussing the APRA regulations and the challenges around compliance. So let's kick off with some introductions. Could each of you tell us about your role in your organization and how many years you've worked in the cybersecurity industry? Let's start with you, Luella. Yeah, hi. Um, I work as the Information Security Manager at West Fund Health Insurance, um, which has about 50,000 members and 200 um, staff members. I've been in West Fund for about two and a half years. And prior to that, I was at um, CBA for about 20 years uh, working in IT. Um, my role currently is focused on um, implementing policies and processes um, to enable us to um, work towards certification for the ISO 27001. Um, and the aim is just to keep our critical assets protected from internal and external mm -hmm. threats. That's great. Me. Thanks, Luella. We'll move on to Andrew. Yeah, my name is Andrew Bullen. I'm the Senior Manager of Governance, Risk and Compliance um, at HBF Health, working in the, the technology, risk and cybersecurity area. Um, HBF Health is a member-based not-for-profit private health insurer. Um, we are the second largest not-for-profit health insurer in Australia and the fifth largest health insurer overall. Uh, my role at the organisation is to manage a number of uh, cybersecurity and risk functions, including a governance risk and compliance function, um, a security assurance function, which is uh, penetration testing and AppSec, um, and a cyber awareness and engagement function. I've been at HBF for about four years uh, as part of the inaugural cybersecurity team stood up here. Um, and, and prior to that, I've also spent about seven years at CBA. Awesome. Thanks, Andrew. And on to Lorenz. Hi, um, I'm Lawrence. I work um, on the GLC team as well alongside Andrew. Um, I'm the GLC lead. Um, before, I've actually been at HBF now for about two and a half years. Um, before that, I was uh, in, in consulting, so I was with KPMG. Actually um, worked with, with Andrew, I guess, on a couple of audits, and that's how we, we met, and that's kind of how I got involved as well, I guess, from a, from a CPS 234 point of view as well, and obviously all uplift work we're doing in that space. Um, previously, before that, was with KPMG in South Africa. Um, so largely a consulting background and, um, yeah, I've, I've got about 16 years, I think in, in the industry. Great. Thank you very much. So a lot of experience here in the panel today. Um, so we will kick off, uh, with Luella starting with what are the major cybersecurity challenges you face in the health insurance industry and what are the industry regulations that you have to comply with? Sure. Okay. So, um, the health industry is, um, you know, a, a good target for cyber threats. Um, I think last year, the half of the world's hospitals experienced um, some kind of IT shutdown as a result of cyber attacks. Um, the critical nature of like healthcare services combined with um, a shift to that kind of virtual care um, makes it a big target. Um, also the information that um, the health healthcare and all health insurance um, sector keeps um, is, um, you know, uh, gives criminals, um, you know, that's what they're looking for, ample um, time to exploit credentials um, is what they're aiming to do. So um, that's that's probably um, the key call out is where a target. Um, and the prudential, the APRA prudential standards that we need to comply with that helps uh, protect that kind of data is CPS 234, which is the information security one, um, CPS 231, which is um, the outsourcing um, standard as well. Uh, yeah, unless I've forgotten one, uh, but they're the, they're the two, two main ones that we need to comply with. Yeah, great. Thank you. And Andrew, uh, we talked previously about the challenges that you faced with APRA um, when APRA released the CPS 234 standards. Um, what was your approach to getting HBF to meet those standards? Uh, for, for those that may not be as familiar with CPS 234, I will say that um, it, it is a very broad principles-based standard with varying levels of specificity throughout. 
um, and, and that has some some pros and cons. It is meant to scale based on your your threat landscape, the the risks, vulnerabilities, um, and threats that your organisation may face at varying levels of the financial services sector. Um, which means that smaller entities are not being left with an expensive bill that they can't foot for implementing controls and larger entities aren't necessarily let off the hook. Uh, but some of the cons with this are that it, it makes it very hard to discern exactly what APRA is looking for with respect to your controls. And you really are having to engage uh, a lot with them to kind of understand what you think you need to implement and have in place to meet the CPS 2344 expectations um, versus what they might be seeing from other entities at a similar scale. As a, a member-based not-for-profit, we don't want to overspend in this area, but we also don't want to underinvest. And ultimately, at the end of the day, it's all about the longevity of the organization and protecting the members that we service. Uh, initially, our approach was to look at CPG 234 as the accompanying guidance and kind of work out what we thought was reasonable for us to implement and uh, propose a program of work to, to go about uh, uplifting our controls and practices. We then brought in a consultancy to kind of ratify that process. Um, and it turned out we were, a little being, uh, we were being a little bit conservative based on their view. So they put forward a, a much more expansive program for us to embark on. And the truth from consulting with APRA was kind of somewhere in between. So what we ended up with was 26 projects over around 18 months to deliver uplifting controls and practices across the organization and a 400% headcount increase in the technology risk and cybersecurity space, which is quite a substantial change for the company. Um, obviously that involved bringing executive board and leaders across the organization along for the journey to make sure they understood why we were doing what we we're doing um, and, and what kind of um, expectations we had on them as far as uplifting and changing practices but also really stressing that because it is a principles-based standard that's meant to change with your organization's specific situation, as we expand and grow as an organization, as the threat landscape surrounding the organization changes, the compliance requirements will also change alongside with that. So it's not a matter of meeting compliance at a particular point in time, compliance to CBS 234 is a kind of a continued journey as it were. And so manage the expectation that it's not, um, we, we tick a box and then and we're compliant, but we actually have to continuously reassess where we sit against this compliance standard and constantly provide APRA with assurances that we are um, rising to the occasion for security controls in line with their expectations. Yeah, fantastic. And has what you've put in place been something that um, you kind of aim to be a repeatable process over time as well? Yes, of course. We have uh, an annual cadence of refreshing what we see as our our, our posture against some key industry standards, including NIST, ISO, uh, and a few other areas. We also have an ongoing controls assurance and testing program to constantly test how we sit against certain controls. That all feeds into an annual strategy where we look at compliance to standards, we look at our posture and what needs to change, we look at our threat landscape, uh, and we propose what, what sort of activities we might need to do over the next year to um, continuously improve the practice. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. And when when it came to getting stakeholders on board, you mentioned it, you you needed to bring along um, your executives and and the board along this journey. Um, how did you go about getting those stakeholders on board? So a lot of it was around uh, initially communicating the need to become compliant with a standard once it was released, and and what that looked like from an effort and expenditure perspective, and how long it would take us to get to compliance. Um, so that the board and the executive are very well aware of uh, our need to be APRA compliance and what that means for us as an enterprise. That's an easy sell from that perspective. The, the more challenging piece is, is what we're proposing commensurate with the compliance obligations that we're looking to rise to. Uh, again, I mentioned we don't want to overspend. We also don't want to fall short of the, the particular bar that APRA may want to set for us. Um, so making sure we provide them some comfort that we have done our due diligence and uh, done that assessment and even engaged externally to uh, help ratify that assessment to provide input to based on the broader understanding of the industry. Yeah, so obviously this has been a, a massive undertaking. And Luella, I understand that your experience at West Fund um, with APRA standards has been very similar to HBF. Um, so how did you go about designing and applying a framework for West Fund to comply with the relatively vague standards uh, from APRA on CPS 234? Uh, yeah, so we, we selected the ISO 27001 um, information security standard um, framework because 
it closely kind of matches the CPS 234 APRA standard. Um, it has been a test and learn process as we've gone along as well. Um, there's been a lot of um, trying to understand what the actual standard uh, means, but the closer we get to where we think um, our maturity level is, also matches our maturity level with the ISO 27001. So having that framework actually helps us um, to continually um, uplift um, as the business changes as well. Um, so the way we looked at it was if we've got the right framework in place, um, that would assist us um, on focusing in the right areas, making sure that we were doing the right controls testing as well. Um, again, it's a set of policy and processes, but it's embedding those processes and then being able to um, test them and supply evidence that you're um, managing that control appropriately. So definitely a journey, a long journey. Yeah. And uh, with that journey as well, um, I understand that you can work with APRA in order to um, understand their take and kind of develop your strategies around that. So how have you found working with APRA on uh, meeting those standards? Uh, look, um, through our Chief Risk and uh, Compliance Officer, who um, is our main contact with APRA, is, um, you know, when they request information um, around our information assets, it's being able to, um, being able to supply that information efficiently. Sometimes, uh, you know, the part, the hard part is actually sometimes just getting all your documentation into place to be able to um, submit um, what they're looking for um, and making sure that, um, that you, you yourself understand what they're looking for. So um, part of the documentation gathering can be um, the onerous part of it, but um, we, we feel that we've built a, a, a better relationship with APRA through being able to um, supply and uh, support where our journey is on that uh, CPS 234, um, because it is a journey, um, again, um, you know, there's so many different elements of it um, and, you know, they did put out their cloud paper to help you kind of like join it all together with the CPS 231, um, understanding um, what really is a material outsourced arrangement um, and then kind of then going back to CPS 234. Um, they, they obviously felt they ha had a need to write the cloud uh, kind of guidance document to, to bridge those two together. Um, yeah, so uh, again, I think um, we've built a better relationship with APRA and they help us build our resilience as well. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Um, so one of the common challenges our customers are presented with is having to assess a lot of vendors in a short period of time. And that is something that uh, with the health insurance industry becoming regulated through APRA, um, I understand all of you needed to do. So um, this is something that HBF has been through recently. So I'm, I'm really interested to hear, Lorenz, what were the challenges you faced in having to assess a large number of vendors in a rel relatively short amount of time? And what did you have to change or implement? And how did you overcome the challenges that the CPS 234 standards presented? Yeah. Um, so firstly, I think in, in the beginning, um, and before we started the whole, I guess, CPS 234 journey, we had a single um, way of assessing vendors, meaning every vendor that we assessed, we put through um, a similar process. Um, and it wasn't really risk-based at all. So the first thing we actually introduced was um, bringing in a risk-based approach to vendor assessments as well. Um, so that meant uh, every vendor that we um, ended up assessing, we um, put a tier to them or a risk profile and and ultimately we split that up into high high medium and low risk vendors and then the, the level of rigor and detail of the assessment will then be directly related to the assessed um, risk level of a particular vendor so as an example say for instance for a high risk vendor we would actually look for something like a SOC report, ISO 27001 certification, or we'll actually do a very detailed assessment through one of our um, <clears throat> partners, like for instance, KPMG or Deloitte, or whoever, basically one of the big four uh, we would use for those assessments. And for the, for the lower risk ones, like the medium risk, et cetera, as well, we had other organizations as well that could do that type of assessment for us as well. 
Um, and, and the idea was really just to to scope uh, the level of assessment aligned to risk. And that's actually brought down a lot of, I guess, the time required to assess the vendor as well. And I should have actually started with this as well, but also what we've done right at the beginning before we actually even went into assessing vendors, we've set up a set of tiering questions or threshold questions rather, which then we, we go, went through an exercise. And so for instance, if a vendor handled data or, or if for instance, they were cloud service or critical service based on those questions, we'd actually then determine, should we do an assessment in the first instance? So a lot of it was actually just to I guess manage a big workload because we had at that point in time over a thousand vendors that we had to assess and it was really bringing down that that list as far as possible to and I, I guess into something that's manageable as well and so there's a couple of i guess stage gates we implemented to to make sure we assess the things we need to assess and 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 also align to the risk level that they um i guess um pose for us as organization um yeah and i think that's such a key thing we actually used to to overcome that ultimately yeah, great. And that's um, obviously you, you've had to build some robust processes around that with the eye-watering number of vendors to uh, assess in a short period of time. Um, what would you say has been the most beneficial learning of going through that process? And what would you different? What would you do differently now if you were put back into that situation, knowing what you know now? Yeah, I think off the back, uh, you know, from from I think one of the positive things that we've learned is definitely the risk based approach to assessments has been to the assessments have been a good step or step in the right direction. Because um, obviously, you don't want to subject a, a low risk vendor to the same level of scrutiny that you do a high risk vendors. Uh, and also, I guess it buys down on time and also cost ultimately that you need to spend on, on delivering this or getting vendors assessed. So I think that was a, that's a good outcome for us. Um, we also learned that communication is, is really key in this because um, as part of this process, obviously, we we engaged with a lot of vendors. We've also engaged with a lot of stakeholders across across our organization just to understand or to get the right answers to this initial tearing gate questions as well. And the way that we've approached that really is, just, you know, we started off by sending targeted emails to, to, to relevant stakeholders. What we found eventually is that, you know, um, without giving people a lot of, because everyone answers a question differently. So, so for instance, as an example, if we say, um, ask a question, is it a critical service? If I work in this particular area for my area, that might be a critical service. But in the context of a, of a broad organization, it might be, well, basically negligible, really. That service can, can go missing and we won't even bat an eye. Um, so I guess this is, is then as well to, to touch base with various areas, really, and kind of um, relaying what do we actually mean by a critical service, for instance. So I guess in these things, communications is key. And initially, we, we had a lot of data issues like that. For instance, someone would say something is critical, but it's actually not, et cetera. So... I think something that I've learned from that really is change management and, and I guess the way that you engage your business to make sure that you kind of put enough information out there to make sure people are aware of what you're trying to achieve, how you're going to achieve it. And I guess also the way that you actually, in the context that you're looking at those particular questions that you're asking, because um, that has been, I think, for us a, a big learning in, in this space as well. Ultimately, that's also been fed into our existing processes as well, the way that we do things now. And I guess another thing that we've done as well in addition to that is this, we've actually developed a shorter questionnaire process as well so it used to be quite a lengthy questionnaire we've actually snapped it down to about 50 questions from initially you know over 200 odd questions that we used to have because i think you know it's i guess again vendors don't want to go around around answering 200 questions i think if you can keep it short and keep it to a point i guess that's that's better obviously scale it up and down based on risk level um yeah i think that's as i would say is our learnings yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Um, Luella, in your experience, um, noting that the current standards uh, of CPS 234 are somewhat vague, what have you found that APRA is really focused on when it comes to their auditing? Um, documentation. I mean, uh, being able to have consistent documentation, but um, uh, sorry, I think, I think, for us, it's been um, that their focus has got kind of shifted a tiny bit um, more towards incident management and also ensuring um, that you've got contingency plans for your much bigger supplier. So the, the suppliers that you that you heavily rely on, again, your more critical services, um, 
again, we, we followed a similar practice with the tiering model, um, being able to identify exactly who is critical and then having that kind of um, uh, deeper understanding of what that vendor's um, security posture is like um, and making sure that they are also, you know, um, regularly testing their incident response plan, they've got BCPs, um, and that you as a business have a contingency plan um, that if something happens um, and that vendor disappears all of a sudden that you know your business is not um, disabled completely um, so I feel like their 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 um, focus has moved quite quite a bit in the last um, 12 to 18 months and maybe um, that shift is about moving towards that new standard that they're about to release I, I feel that that is kind of um, where they're pivoting towards yeah, certainly, and I think we uh, will be coming to that a little bit later in the discussion. Um, so with that being said, what are the main steps or, or focus points for West Fund in preparation for being audited? Uh, I, I think what we tend to do is um, look at um, what documentation that we have, um, the controls testing. So um we, have, we haven't had a massive audit. We've been asked direct questions about some of our frameworks and um, outsourcing policies and stuff like that. Um, so what we tend to do is um, through the ISO 27001 um, framework that we've put in place um, is to ensure that our policies are like a, a up to date and that we've got those processes embedded um, so that we can quickly um, show that we've uh, complied or we um, have tested those particular controls that they're looking at. Um, so being able to produce the information um, quickly and consistently. So if the question is, you know, how many managed services um, do you have in IT or, um, you know, how many pure outsourcing relationships do you have, it's being able to um, identify that information quickly, um, make sure that uh, we feel comfortable with um, our response and that it is, you know, in fact, what we're doing. Yeah, great. Thank you. And noting uh, what you said earlier, that, that documentation is a particularly important part of your processes for compliance and what APRA is, is looking for, um, do you have a repeatable process for any time it, it um, kind of becomes known that you need a documentation around um, a particular function. Do you have a process that's repeatable around that to make that uh, nice and easy for you? Uh, look, uh, I think being a smaller organisation, um, there's a, you know, we need the stakeholders involved um, within the organisation. Uh, so we tend to be able to have those conversations very quickly. Um, we have... Um, you know, our key um, chief risk and um, compliance officer who who would have had that conversation to, to really gain an understanding of what APRO is looking at. Uh, we then, um, you know, have been really, uh, through the ISO 27001, um, good at creating that documentation structures so that we um, can put our hands on um, a list of suppliers or uh, which critical assets are, you know, uh, with which suppliers um, so it, it for us it's about um, um, implementing like things like this our supply governance framework so we really have identified which suppliers do fall into that critical list um, and then uh, are being able to um, respond to the questions that APRA is asking us so a part of it is um, kind of being organised, right? It's about saying, well, um, these are our suppliers, these are the ones that fit in that tier, these are the ones that we've assessed um, and these are the contingency plans that we have in place with these particular, you know, um, suppliers or, or, or third or fourth party suppliers. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, and, you know, who would have thought being organised would make things run smoother? <laughs> um, <It does. laughs> Uh, Andrew, um, we also discussed HBF going through a, a similar sort of process um, with APRA as well at the moment. So from your latest experience uh, being audited, what would be some of your key learnings that you wish you knew about beforehand? So the, the tripartite audit has been a very interesting process and probably a little bit different from uh, some of the other audits that we may have been through either with APRA or for, through our internal audit processes. Uh, technically, our audit is still in flight 
So yeah, I think fingers crossed the outcomes are all positive. Uh, look, we uh, felt very prepared from a sense that our controls, capabilities and practices that we put in place um, were, were or are very good. Um, and the, the work that we've done to get to a state of compliance, I think Luella's hit on some very crucial points there around being organised and having a documentation in order and basically being ready for the order process. And that's kind of uh, where we're maybe a little bit less prepared. Uh, over the course of the audit, we've submitted more than 500 artefacts. Uh, we've had many meetings, the audit process is running for a number of months now. Uh, we could honestly throw a full-time resource and they, all they could do is a tripartite audit. Um, but otherwise, instead, we balance that workload across the, the broader team. So I think preparation is key. It has required that we create a number of bespoke documents specific to that audit process. So having that, that visibility of what those artifacts look like up front. Um, and what format they're expected, and maybe some examples from your auditing teams, uh, probably very helpful. Um, as far as getting organized, uh, what, what I would have loved to have done, uh, given a time machine and going back uh, six to 12 months, is really have a robust list of the, the controls that we have in place against different requirements, um, which, which we do have, but then the documentation that supports that and the kind of evidence we might provide to support the execution of that documentation. Uh, all of those processes of documentation references uh, as well as uh, pre-engaging some of the stakeholders that may need to produce those documents and uh, be involved in interviews. So we had done some of that, that organization prior to the, the actual audit activity itself, but we maybe didn't have all of our ducks in a row as much as I might like, and it would have made the process a lot smoother and a lot uh, lower effort for us. Uh, so for anyone else who's regulated and, and yet to go through the tripartite process, that's probably a good tip to start with. Um, per any audit process as well, the uh, the documentation you have needs to very closely represent exactly what you've executed on. Um, so where we might have some gaps, for example, is where we have said, say we, we conduct a particular check, say we'll talk policy framework, for example, that we might check our policy as a, a key control to the organization on a quarterly basis, but we don't necessarily update our policies on a quarterly basis. That control doesn't make sense for us to check it every three months. We may check it annually based on the cadence at which we'd refresh it. But the auditors will come in and say, you said that every key control is checked on a quarterly basis, but you haven't checked this one on a quarterly basis, why not? So that needs to be very clear in your documentation if there are any departures from, uh, say, a, a simplified process or where a process may get a bit more complicated, that that is appropriately documented so they can check that the process you have is being followed. Uh, yeah, so great. The, the TLDR being be more prepared <laughs> and make sure your processes <laughs> accurately and completely reflect the processes you're executing on. Yeah, so it's kind of rounding back to that, um, being organized and, and documenting everything that you're doing, essentially. Yeah. Um, Luella, at West Fund, you've been building out your supplier governance framework over the last 18 months in a, in a similar sort of way. Um, through the process of putting that together and now kind of going through implementing that framework, what are the main roadblocks you've experienced so far and what are your primary focuses when it comes to implementation? Uh, I think the main roadblocks um, were, I think is um, understanding the landscape. Um, and I think um, similar to what Rowan's pointed out before was um, it's the scalability um, and not, not, understanding um, which ones are more critical. Otherwise, you would go through that process for all your vendors. Um, and I think Andrew pointed out for if you ask the question, um, is that vendor critical? The answer is always yes. Um, I think even doing BCP recently, we, we did our BCP, go back to the to um, doing um, a BIA, which is your business impact analysis, and you go to the business and say, which is, which are your critical vendors? And they, they tend to list pretty much everything. So um, so I think part of the journey was learning to um, to be able to categorise um, using a tiering system, which are the more critical vendors, um, and then creating that fit for purpose governance. Um, unfortunately, sometimes supply governance can seem like it's um, a roadblock for the business itself, right, because the business wants to run at this like really fast speed because, um, you know, that's the way the digital world is um, and stopping and doing those assessments sometimes can feel like you're you're slowing down the business so um, one of the challenges is actually 
getting the company to go on that journey with you as well to understand, look, this is this is what we need to do. We want to make it fit for purpose and scalable. Um, so, yeah, it's been an interesting um, 18 months and we're, we're kind of at the end of um, implementing and establishing those processes. Um, it's still a test and learn um, and it's amazing um, uncovering more more vendors than you kind of knew you had as well, like um, each business kind of suddenly, oh, I've got this contract over here or, you know, uh, we're, we're doing business with this but it's only small. So um, it's really getting into the business and uh, working with those stakeholders to understand how many vendors and what, what their relationship is and how critical it is to... Um, to that that business department. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, uh, Lodens, moving on now to the frameworks that you've got in place currently at HBF. Uh, what does your vendor onboarding process look like now after moving to a more risk-based approach following the those standards coming out? Yeah, so um, I guess one of the key things that we've picked up as well is the, the need for those additional threshold questions where you actually determine which vendors should be assessed by by the, the cyber team or technology risk. Um, and um, initially, there was nothing, I guess, embedded in, in the workflows from a procurement point of view for that. Um, it will basically be, I guess, we, we have a procurement process. Invariably, it may or may not come to, to cyber for assessment. Um, so we've actually then ended up embedding our threshold questions with in the procurement process as well, uh, meaning that every vendor that actually does go through a procurement process, invariably they have to answer those three questions to determine is it in scope for a cyber assessment. So that was kind of a key, I guess, from an onboarding point of view that we need to bring in place. And what we then also uh, ended up doing is, is a lot of the learnings that we've got from, we actually, a lot of the learnings from our uh, initial assessment of those thousand vendors, we've actually um, made that or kind of um, implemented that into a formal vendor risk assessment process. So we've actually then produced a document, is actually communicated out to the rest of the business. It's published. It's a formal document that we can refer to as well. Um, and with that document as well, we, we introduced a couple of new things as well. So one of the things that we, we brought in was the notion of a baseline risk profile assessment. So for, for every vendor that we, so this is now every vendor that comes to us after it's been um, identified by procurement that needs to come to cyber for assessment, we've actually defined some additional questions then that determines the risk, the risk rating for a particular vendor. Um, that's all kind of f f formalized in that document as well. Um, and then further as well, as is we built upon this idea that we need to assess high risk vendors in a bit more detail and low risk vendors in less detail by introducing um, a point system as such. So the way we've actually gone about it is, as we said, for instance, you know, um, for high risk vendors, an example, they need to obtain 80 assurance points. And I guess, um, but the easiest way to explain that is so we actually then had um, for each type of assurance artifact, we actually assigned points to them. So say for instance, a SOC 2 type 2 report, so say for instance, it covers the scope of a service that we are consuming. Typically, that would be the ultimate, I guess, um, resource for us to validate uh, the maturity of a vendor, and that will be 80 points. Um, the, the reason we went this route as well is it's made it more scalable. So meaning that if you've got a low risk vendor, they only had to get 20 assurance points, you can get away with something like a questionnaire um, and maybe some documents from their, you know, from their um, governance frameworks. And so it's, it's almost like, I guess, that point system made it very clear exactly what the expectation is. And it takes, it took away some of the subjectivity as well, because back in the, when we we're doing all those assessments for, for APRA as part of a cyber program, we ended up actually, um, I guess it was it was myself and, and Andrew and some of the guys actually were looking closely at this and, and managing that as well. So this made, this made the repeatable process as well that you know, any team member can actually take and, and, and know what to do. Um, and yeah, that's, that's and also we then introduced the idea of a baseline of the baseline risk profile. And we've done this assessment, then obviously there's also some maturities that we brought in as well. So each vendor would then have a, a four tier maturity rating from that, um, which also goes from you know advanced to basic. Um, and that we've actually plotted that on a matrix uh, ultimately. So if someone comes in at a higher risk, for instance, they need to obtain at least an advanced rating to be to be to have a residual risk. Um, rating of low, for instance, and the whole idea was actually to make that in a way that's it's easily consumable by a business. Um, yeah, that was, I guess, the, the key things we, we brought in there. Um, but indeed, a lot of it is actually trying to 
to live. I think the overarching notion is to try and leverage things that are out there already for what vendor. And you'll find normally your high risk vendors are hopefully in most cases the, the large organizations. So they typically have things like ISIS certificates and, and SOC reports and the smaller ones, hopefully normally the less risky ones are also the ones that typically don't have all those artifacts and it kind of works out well that way. But I guess that's the whole point. This is kind of to make the easier, uh, easier process for our vendors, but also at the same time get the enough, I guess, evidence to, to, to kind of attest to their control and their information security capabilities. Um, yeah. I think that's what we brought in. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. And and I, I guess what what factors into that maturity model that you've got? Um, you know, what what's the difference between basic and advanced? Um, so so basically, I guess there's two things. Um, so the one is uh, for the baseline profile, which is actually that a tier that we assign to the vendor. So in determining what that particular tier for that vendor is. We would then actually go and look at, you know, what is the type of information shared? Is it uh, personal identifiable information? Is it maybe sensitive um, information regarding to internal vulnerabilities for our organization? There's a number of things that we look at. Maybe it's IP specific. So we'll come up with what, what that risk rating is. And I guess then from there, if we look at, um, I guess, different tiers that we, or the different maturities that we assign. So we've built a questionnaire. So um, I think I've mentioned in a, um, our initial question around TPRM that we've got, um, effectively, we've got uh, a couple of questions that we ask. Um, and I think from, from that perspective, yes, we win, we basically then just, I guess, um, Based on those questions, we've been determined, um, you know, uh, I have a response to him. Sorry, I'm kind of mumbling a little bit. But the way they respond to those questions effectively then determines whether they're advanced, um, basic, or, or um, you know, whatever that is. But, but each question has a, I guess, a, a model answer to it and what you're kind of expecting to be in place. And ultimately, all of those questions are, are tallied up. And then based on that, there's a score actually that, that pops out at the end of the day that says if you're advanced or not. And typically, we'd expect a high-risk vendor to be advanced, um, typically, or at least advanced. And a low-risk one, they, we can get away there with, so for instance, if they are intermediate, for instance. Um, and whenever there's an instance where we, um, you know, we find that the controls are not really um, that great, then we follow a risk-based approach uh, and do something like a risk assessment and potentially go and capture some actions to remove mediate those gaps as well. Yeah, awesome. And we have a question here from Michael Lee. Um, this one is is on topic, uh, kind of on topic as to what you've just been talking about as well. Um, he says, uh, Loden's mentioned that HBF streamlined their questionnaire from approximately 200 questions down to 50. How did you manage to do that while ensuring you still captured all of the information that you needed? Yeah, so we found that a lot of the questions when we had in the old questionnaire I could have been combined into, I guess. So the previous questionnaire was, was almost like an open questionnaire. So we had a couple of questions, and those were quite open-ended, where the, the new questionnaire was actually kind of combining some of those things, some of those elements into a single question. And then we also changed that to be a more like a, not like a multiple choice, but almost that predefined criteria in the answers as well, which allowed us to then score it. And and the notion there was really is this, I think, you know, sometimes when you and you look at um, things, you can potentially cut down a lot of questions because not all questions are equally important. And was really like focusing on what are the key areas from a, from a CPS 234 point of view that we want to focus on more. And typically you would find that, um, areas such as incident management, um, maybe uh, things around how does, do those vendors manage their third parties, what do you do around governance, we'll focus on those key areas. And, and typically as well, we then supplement that with um, evidence from things like their, their attestation reports that they've got as well. And that's kind of how we come up with that final view as well. Um, but yes, yeah, really, I think we found that a lot of questions were not really required ultimately. Um, yeah. That makes sense, yeah. Um, Andrew, in running the governance, risk and compliance team at HBF, what have you recognized at a high level as processes that you have now that you couldn't operate without? Well, that's a good question. Um, so we have a number of established practices around reporting to the, the executive uh, and, and board team uh, around 
say monthly or quarterly scorecards. Uh, we produce a lot of metrics. In fact, there's three PowerPoint slides worth of metrics and commentary for those scorecards and accompanying memos. Uh, provide them with the, an amount of detail that allows them to kind of understand where the organisation is at, any challenges that we might be facing, uh, and where maybe they need to probe us a little bit further to say I'm not happy with as an AMBER status for a particular area. Um, I did just allude to RAG statuses. I think that's important as well. Um, the, the executive and the board cannot be expected to be cybersecurity and risk experts all of the time or understand the full technical subject matter. So having set thresholds to be able to stand behind those thresholds for red, amber, green, um, effectively directing their attention to um, where, where that attention is needed, as opposed to maybe just seeing a large number and not realizing that number is quite normal, or maybe an especially low number and realizing that number is quite normal or within risk tolerance. Uh, we even produced a, a, a speci specific CPS234 dashboard to make sure there is comfort um, on our compliance stat status and where something might be slipping or, or need additional attention or investment in order to make sure that we're continuing to meet our obligations. Um, additionally, we, we produce a lot of memos. Uh, the GRC team is a memo producing machine. It's a lot of written commentary we produce for the, the executive and the board through different committees. Um, and, and we do have direct access to some of the executive, including the CIO, CRO, uh, and even the CFO from time to time to talk about cybersecurity and, and risk management and, and generally in technology risk. Um, I think that broader engagement with the, the executive and the direct access to executive is very important for our function to be able to get, uh, say, a shorter feedback loop on something that we're working on or raise concerns quicker and get action quicker rather than something waiting for a, a monthly or quarterly dashboard or a committee of some sort. Yeah, great. Thank you. And uh, we, we did have another question here, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Dwayne Blakely, um, which is, uh, I think you, you may have, have answered this um, in your response just now. Um, but Andrew, what is the key message you want the board members to know? Are there key metrics that you have found that they consistently want to see? Um, and I, I love your, um, you know, red, yellow, green um, kind of methodology there. Um, obviously, traffic lights are always pretty good. Uh, red, stop. This is important. Um, so, yeah. Uh, do you have any? Uh, what What is the key message you want the board members to know? And uh, what are the key metrics you found that they want to see? Well, sometimes there's a disconnect between what we'd like them to know, which is how well we're doing and how how well their investment is being managed and those kind of things versus what they actually want to hear about. Uh, and often what they like to hear about is any incidents or events that have occurred over a period of time, especially anything that has any kind of uh, significant impact to the company, which the, there are very few at HVF. We're quite fortunate, um, but there are events that arise that identify where there might be a room for improvement or, or where there might be some poor practices in a particular area of the business that needs to be addressed more immediately. They're always keen to see those. They also love to see our controls testing, controls assurance program to understand where we currently sit against certain controls, where there might be gaps and what we're doing about it. I think that really directs their attention to the continuous process of reassessing ourselves um, and making improvements rather than say sitting stagnant or, uh, or um, resting on our haunches or, or something similar. Um, third party risk, another big one they like to see. Um, they like to see commentary on where we are running certain projects, the uplift cybersecurity controls, how those are tracking, the, the financial spend, the delivering to times and to the expected quality. Um, we often get questions that are entirely left of field based on something someone's read or a contact that they, they might have spoken to at a different company that's dealing with a particular issue. Uh, for example, ransomware comes up from time to time. How prepared are we for a particular ransomware event? Uh, we're equipped to respond to that and say we have certain measures in place. Uh, we have say, certain protocols we would follow. We have playbooks, um, incident response procedures, everything else that we might need to deal with that particular event. Uh, and whether or not we've, we've seen attempts at, say, a ransomware event for the company. Um, so it's a mixed bag of we have regular reporting we provide, which is a mixture of what we think they need to know, because as I said before, they can't be experts in all things, um, and what they've asked us to tell them about. But then also we field queries from time to time based on um, ex external data sources they might have access to or, or things they might have seen or heard about. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, 
Luella, looking to the future, with, uh, with constant changes to the cyber threat landscape and changes to reg regulations and requirements, in particular with APRA combining a number of standards into a new operational mis risk management standard, CPS 230, uh, coming up shortly, what are the initial steps that you'll take when that standard is released? Um, cool. So, yeah, so the standard kind of focuses on three different areas. Um, there's like operational risk management, business continuity and service provider management. Um, so if I break them up into those three categories, the first one, um, we're kind of required to map and manage our third and fourth party suppliers. Um, so I think it is, again, extending out that um, amount of information that we have on our current suppliers, um, again, based on that, that tiering rating, um, and just continually build out that understanding of um, the um, connection between their, the third and fourth party suppliers um, and that continual monitoring of, of those um, suppliers as well. We'll need to review each of our critical supply contracts as well, make sure um, that they, um, against the standard to see if they need to be uplifted, which is very similar to what we did with CPS 234. You go back to your contract, um, you have a look at what the standards are asking and making sure that that vendor, um, you know, can comply to that higher standard as well. Um, so that we'll be doing a bit of that. Um, hopefully not all of our suppliers, now we've kind of got, got them grouped into those um, different tiers. Um, looking at our um, policies, so things like our outsourcing policy might need to be uplifted and reviewed and then um, re-signed off again. So that, that kind of covers that operational risk management. And then business continuity, um, it's kind of ensuring um, all the stakeholders have an understanding of their accountability as to um, the BCP and ensuring that we revisit um, all our contingency plans as well to make sure that they are fit for purpose against the standard. So um, again, it's like having that internal look to see, okay, so this is a standard, it's a bit higher. Um, what, what do we need? What's the gap analysis? So we'll perform a gap analysis as well and see where we need to uplift around that. Um, and the last one is the um, service provider management, um, which is uh, building resilience into critical operations, um, clearly identify metrics that we will monitor um, and measure against each supplier. I think um, these guys are probably a bit further ahead of um, the game than we are in terms of um, having um, understanding what tolerance levels that we have for each supplier and setting them against what our risk appetite is. Um, so, yeah, so I think the initially is doing a gap ass assessment of where we are now, looking at the new standard and say, what do we have to do to really comply to that standard and, and how much work is required? Um, you know, it takes a bit of time to go back to a vendor and, and renegotiate a contract as well. So. You know, there's there's uh, time and resources required um, to do those things. So um, yeah, um, it's kind of um, you know just got that game finished. Now it's the next one. So yeah, that's 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 what our, our approach will be anyway. Yeah, great, thank you. And um, a Andrew, noting that uh, you'll have to go through a similar process at HBF, uh, what's going to be a key part of your strategy towards um, gaining CPS 230 compliance as well? And has the implementation of CPS 234 and what you've gone through there um, given you a good basis to move towards that compliance as well? I think the experience we've had with the tripartite is very valuable and a lot of what Luella said I'll try not to duplicate because it's a very similar approach of kind of understanding where we're at, what the gaps are and the, the key areas we may need to revisit and uplift. Um, we have a lot of good things in place around BCP disaster recovery, management material outsourcing arrangements, um, general third party risk management, controlled assurance and testing, general operational risk management. I think we are well set up towards CPS 230. Uh, ultimately though the the all the practices and frameworks we might put in place from a process and documentation perspective needs to be backed up by action that can be demonstrated to an auditor um, so really the the awareness and understanding of risk management at the, the organization needs to be very robust and risk management needs to be baked into the existing day-to-day -day practices or the, the culture of the organization 
if we're saying that teams um, talk about risk management and use the risk management framework, we maybe need to demonstrate that in team meetings or huddles, it's one of their agenda items they talk about is risk management. We can demonstrate that they've raised issues or concerns or taken action, uh, but also making sure the, the seriousness of addressing a particular deficit that might be raised by a, a team member is um, of high importance in the agenda, both from a reporting standpoint, so we raise up the chain to executive and board to say how we're we tracking to uh, resolve certain issues that we have and, and how much of a priority is this being given. Um, that's, that's another thing I think that we, we would need to demonstrate. Uh, again, going back to our lessons learned from the tripartite audit around, we, we have these documented processes and now we need to know exactly how we're going to um, show the operating effectiveness of those processes. And they're actually being used and operated on by the, the players in the organization. And that we are um, to the point around metrics and reporting that we are monitoring what we have and that we are providing appropriate insights to the leadership of the organization to understand where we're at, provide necessary scrutiny and help us to correct course if needed. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, it definitely seems like you, um, you know, HBF and West Fund have very similar approaches here. Um, and Lodens, talking about what's coming up, how do you see the role of cybersecurity at HBF evolving over the next six to 12 months? And how uh, do you effectively scale your cybersecurity operations to manage an expanding organization? Yeah, so one of the initiatives that we currently have in place is, is actually to, I guess, boost our technology as well in the cybersecurity space. Um, because at, at this stage, a lot of our processes like third party risk and, and vulnerability management, all these processes are effectively manual workflows. And we're currently in the process of, of implementing uh, EGRC solution. So a lot of it is actually to, to bring those processes and workflows into, uh, into a system as well, which will give it that, I guess, additional rigor as well to make sure that, you know, processes always flow the way that they should flow. Um, and, and ultimately, as well as this, the EGRC solution will, will ultimately in between so like risk management will be in there third party risk will be in there vulnerability management um effectively every every um different area of a business be it procurement finance uh, um, risk management everyone will be together on one platform so it will be a single glass pane view of the world and and as well that will allow us as well to get, gain a lot of efficiencies as well in in the i guess in our processes because currently say for instance um we're having to maintain multiple we're having to maintain our own third party risk register as an example um that will in future be in the system it will be maintained by procurement we will leverage off of the information um, and I guess a lot of the things as well we're looking to do as well. So, so for instance, we're using UpGuard as well. Um, and the idea is also to uh, basically integrate that as well to the EGL solu EGRC solution. And I guess also from a third party risk point of view, when we do identify those gaps with our vendors as well, that ends up being a manual exercise where we actually go and you know, follow up with that vendor on remediation actions and, and it comes up in, I guess, contract management meetings as well. But uh, as well, the future of the system would actually allow us for all those findings and issues to identify to flow through uh, naturally into the systems and the risk management systems. And we can actually effectively track um, remediation activities and so on as well. So I think a big focus for us in, in the next six to 12 months is just to get things into into uh, into that platform and and that will help us a lot um i guess from a resourcing perspective as well um as part of a cyber hbs um i guess journey to, to towards cps 234 compliance we did beef up um i guess our, our resources our people resources a lot um i guess now it's just to get the, the, the processes and the systems as well aligned to that to better support those first people um and i guess gain some efficiencies as well along the way um yeah and i think that's really a bit of a focus i guess in the next the next six to twelve months yeah, great. And you, you mentioned a, a number of times in there, um, you know, getting things into your systems and your processes. So what are the major tools that you use currently? Um, you mentioned UpGuard there. Um, what are the major tools that you use currently in your vendor risk management processes? Yeah, so for vendor risk management, really, it is. Um, I guess it's a combination of internal process. So we've got we've got the, um, the vendor risk assessment process that we've defined. And I guess from a, from a tooling perspective, really, it's just just for upcore tooling that we use at this station. That's um, 
obviously using it as a ven uh, as a rating service as part of our vendor assessment process but also on top of that we also use for breach um, reporting capability um, and that actually then interfaces to our um, defensive cyber operations team who you know, so for instance if there is a data breach picked up or something they'll actually handle that through an incident management process um, so i guess from a third party point of view that's really what we use um, but then from a I guess uh, more from organization wide thing as well, for vulnerability management, et cetera. We've got things like Tenable that we use as well to, to manage third, not, not third party risk, but I guess in general, just around applications as well. We will actually identify vulnerabilities, et cetera, around those applications, and we can actually pick those up and patch them. Um, so I guess that's the only really other thing that would play into the whole third party risk, um, well, area, really. So, Jonathan, you on mute. <laughs> nice. Thank you. <laughs> it needs to happen um, at least once every meeting. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, Andrew, obviously being at HBF as well, what are some considerations there um, when it comes to your tooling um, and your processes around manual versus automation in your risk management? Well, I guess it's a, it's a balancing act of talk to investment uh, as well previously it's really whether or not a process can be effectively run by people in a, in a manual process and the cost involved with that versus a, a tooling based approach of course with automation comes a lot of benefits around the, the quality of your execution on a particular process as well um, an example might be reducing human error uh, or making sure that things happen on a pre-scheduled cadence and they can't necessarily get bumped for some some other priority that comes up um, so our, our consideration and early on a lot of our, our tooling, um, if, if you can call it that, was Excel-based, leveraging Jira, leveraging um, Teams and other tools that we have available to us already to try to build a practice around that and keep everything in, in some kind of central location. Um, and then as we've matured, we've started looking at how can we automate this and take some of that manual overhead away from the team so they can focus on a broader remit of responsibilities. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. And um, just noting the time, I am going to move on to our last question of the discussion. Um, in a recent Gartner research article, one of the major changes coming to the cybersecurity space moving into the next couple of years is going to be how cybersecurity is perceived by boards and C-level executives as a business risk and not just an IT risk. So um, I'll, I'll start on your side, Luella. Um, have you recognized the change in the overall attitude towards cybersecurity at West Fund? And what methods might have you have used in order to gain support and recognition? Uh, yeah, sure. So we've done, um, I've done some training with the board. Um, we've had um, some third party experts come in and talk to the board. Um, we've looked at, you know, discussed things like emerging risks, um, tried to understand also what the board want to see in that kind of reporting um back to them um and and lots of training like um just even like lots of uh fishing training and stuff like that just kind of kept that training and awareness constant um i think also uh their understanding of the, the the regulations um cover that whole information life cycle as well and third parties so um yeah we've done lots of um just discussions and reporting, I think, would be what I would say. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Luella. So that's about all we have time for this afternoon. Um, this discussion has been truly insightful. And uh, on behalf of UpGuard, I'd like to extend our deepest gratitude to our speakers today for giving us their time uh, and sharing their expertise and experience. Um, you guys made this panel discussion uh, particularly easier on your moderator for the day. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone for attending our Q3 Summit. Um, have a great afternoon and we look forward to seeing you next time.